Good evening, everybody. It's uh, Jerry Taves here. I'm the Executive Liaison with Health Sciences Association of Alberta. And we're here uh, tonight to have a town hall to discuss some of the things that are, are going on. Uh, it's taking a while to get through to all of the members who are uh, waiting to get this call. So we're just going to uh, hang on and, and, uh, and uh, wait until more, more uh, numbers have been reached. But uh, in the meantime, this isn't going to be an interactive call, so and I'm going to remind people of this a number of times. Uh, if you have a question or a comment about things that are going on, you can hit star three on your phone. Uh, and your, what will happen is you'll be put through to one of our screeners uh, that we have uh, at the office. And uh, they're just going to take your name and your question and uh, this is the way that we can uh, make sure of all the thousands of people that will be joining us tonight that you, uh, you get your question to come through. So you can do that um, anytime. Uh, go ahead and uh, we're just going to hang out and uh, uh, while we're waiting I'll introduce you to some of the people who are in the room here. Uh, you're going to hear in just a few minutes once uh, we get going here from your president Mike Parker. Uh, and he's going to give us a little bit of a, a briefing on what it is that it, that uh, is going on from from his perspective, from our perspective. Uh, beside him is uh, the vice president Trudy Thompson, and we also have our new executive uh, Mike Boyle, who has uh, been in his new position for eight days, I believe yes. now. So. Uh, uh, we're happy to have him. He was formerly our director of negotiations, so now is the executive director. So just a reminder to uh, hit star three and we'll get going in just a minute. So once again, for those of you who have just joined us, this is uh, Jerry Taze, I'm the executive liaison with Health Sciences Association of Alberta. Uh, and we're here tonight to talk about <clears throat> uh, some of the things that are going on around us and try to put some put some of the news into context uh, of, of your contract and things that, that you're going to be going through. Um, we are going to hear first of all from Mike Parker, uh, who's your vice, your president. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, I gave him a little yeah. demotion there. Yeah. Good um, evening friends. And uh, this is going to be an interactive uh, uh, operation. So if you have a question or a comment at any time, you can uh, just hit star three on your phone and you'll be put through uh, to the screener, one of our screeners who's just gonna take your name down. Um, they're gonna ask if you're a member. This, uh, this number has been published to members and uh, non-members alike, but uh, we're going to uh, allow our members to have uh, questions only tonight because uh, we, we need to allow for for them to have the, the biggest opportunity. Um, yeah, so star three, you'll be put through to one of our screeners, they'll take your name and your uh, questions so that uh, we can then uh, uh, make sure that you get on and all the questions are answered and that we answer them once. Also with me in the room is uh, Vice President Trudy Thompson uh, and uh, your Executive Director Mike Boyle. So we are just going to go through this, uh, actually we're, we're just about through the list so I think uh, what we're going to do is, is get started uh, and I'm going to turn it over to your president Mike Parker uh, who is going to give us a little bit of a uh, backgrounder on, on what's going on in Alberta right now and how it, uh, how it might impact you. Mike. Good evening, friends. You know, it's amazing how uh, technology allows us to spool up 27,000 phone numbers and uh, call them in to join us tonight. So thank you for taking the time to join us. And as Jerry has said, uh, with me is Vice President Trudy Thompson and, and with us as well as Mike Boyle, our Executive Director. You know, thanks, Jerry, and uh, thank you again all for joining us tonight. You know, I was just thinking today, it's exactly one week one week since this provincial government released its blue ribbon panel on the state of the Alberta economy. You saw in my comments on the website, you know that I called it an extremely disappointing day. The government released a partisan report that only takes into consideration 50% of an equation to solve 100% of the problem. They say that Alberta has a spending problem and not a revenue problem. And what do they mean by that? They mean that they think that the government of Alberta spends too much money on, uh, per person on things like roads, on schools, on universities, and yes, on health care as well. They have compared us to the three largest provinces in Canada and show that per capita we spend more here in Alberta. And my friends, they're right. 
Because year after year, this is what Albertans have asked them to do. But what they aren't saying is that Albertans are wildly undertaxed compared to these same provinces. They don't say that if we're taxed like Saskatchewan, which is the second lowest in the country in terms of taxation, that our Alberta deficit would be gone in one year. Not four, not five, but one year. And that's why I am stunned when they turn around and say that Alberta has lost its advantage in attracting business. Please tell me where in Canada, circumstances would be better for a business to make any more money. That, my friends, is simply an out and out lie. It's clear to me that the report's conclusions were already decided even before the panel was selected. So if I'm right, why would this government go through this charade in the first place? Well, we've already had a big hint. One of the first things this new government did was give away $4.5 billion in revenues to our province's most wealthy businesses. Businesses that were already making huge profits were given even more. At the same time as this government refused to honor our negotiated collective agreements and allow for arbitration to go ahead on wages for hundreds and thousands of public sector workers. Folks, it comes down to what we believe in. As a province, do we believe in ensuring benefits for only a few, or do we believe in ensuring benefits for the many? We believe that the Blue Ribbon Panel is recommending recommendations or amounts to cuts and to privatization. The author of this report is Janice McKinnon, a former Saskatchewan finance minister who has written in the past that cuts only hurt the vulnerable in society. And now she is also the same minister who closed more than 50 hospitals in Saskatchewan and mostly in the rural municipalities. McKinnon stated Alberta needs to look at moving services out of hospitals and into private systems. She believes that Alberta needs to close hospitals. She also believes that Alberta needs to legislate salaries of the public sector and reduce the size of the public service. Friends, that is our salaries, that is our jobs, and it impacts our families. Now, I don't want to sound like a chicken little here and say the sky is falling, because it's not. But just think about it. If you want to privatize anything, what would be the easiest? Maybe our labs. Is there a reason that the health minister is wanting to take the word public out of our name? Or how about EMS? We've seen it in other provinces. And there's at least one company knocking at the door who I'm certain is writing an offer as we speak. The current finance minister applauded this report and said it was to be used to determine decisions as they prepare a provincial budget. Then, two days after praising his own report, the minister said, well, it might not go far enough. This province may need to do even more aggressive cuts in its path to privatization. Now friends, I remember in the 90s when we were all asked to do more with less. We all know that it didn't work. We're still suffering the consequences of those decisions. And now we're about to be told to do even more with even less. HSAA is urging this government to reject the recommendations in the McKenna report and sit down with the people who work on the front lines of healthcare every day to find solutions to improving care to patients and with their patients point of view. Thanks Mike, uh, that uh, is sobering for sure. Um, one of the, uh, just before I get on to another topic, I, I wanna remind those of you who are on the line or who have just joined us that you just need to dial star three if you have a question or if you have a comment, we wanna have an interactive discussion here. Uh, um, and what will happen is that you'll get uh, Put through to a screener who will just take your name, find out if you're a member of HSAA and uh, and then put you into a queue so that we can get to your question as, as time permits. Uh, one thing that you didn't talk about yet, uh, Mike, is that whole Bill 9 thing. People are talking about Bill 9. Can you, can you give us a little background on what Bill 9 is and what it means to uh, HSAA members? Thanks, Jerry. Yeah, I assume many of you are hoping to get a bit of an update on what's been happening. I'll do what I can to explain, but with a caution that this is the, the legal status of this bill is changing from day to day. 
And believe me, the last change came only on Thursday. Now I need to back up and see if I can make sense of all of the puzzle pieces here. Because while we were bargaining on our own, any wage increases are tied to other public sector unions. And in particular, I'm talking about the AUPE, the Alberta Teachers, and the United Nurses, who set the table for kind of where we're offered. In each of our agreements in the past, we accepted two zeros in the, in the first two years of a three-year agreement. And that was in recognition that this province was going through the worst recession in over 20 years and that the government introduced large deficit budgets in order to keep the services that Albertans demanded. Now, I don't have to tell you that many of the oil and gas sector workers were laid off, received wage reductions, and my friends, they are still having problems finding work. In many cases, some of us became the sole breadwinners in our household, which saved families and saved those, those homes. In the third year of our agreement, we agreed that we would open up the wage clause and re-bargain that based on the economics of the day. If bargaining on that discussion broke down within a prescribed period of time, either side had the right to send the clause, and that clause only, to an arbitrator for the final decision. AUPE, the nurses, and the teachers were up first. But the teachers deferred their conversation until this fall. Now when bargaining did break down after only one meeting, the arbitrations were set for a date near the end of May. And that's when the UCP government brought in Bill 9, which said that arbitration would not be heard until November, only after the Blue Ribbon Panel's report and the tabling of a provincial budget. UNA believed that this legislation was unconstitutional, and the matter ended up in court with a request for an injunction on the implementation of Bill 9. And my friends, this is exactly what the new government was hoping for in their legal challenge. Winning is not important. Stalling is. We can only speculate about what they have to delay. But that seems to be their intention here. Now how does this affect us at HSAA? I have been asked more than once, why hasn't HSAA filed our own challenge? Well, my friends, it's because nothing has officially happened to us yet. Our date to go to arbitration is after September 30th. So while we know that this will only be a delay based on Bill 9, nothing has yet happened, which means the courts cannot hear our case yet. But because our agreement included in Bill 9, we were allowed to have intervener status, which meant that our lawyers had the opportunity to present our facts to the courts when AUPE brought their cases forward. So fast forward to July, Court of Queen's Bench Justice granted the injunction to Bill 9. The government immediately filed an appeal against that decision. That's the decision that, that was made up two weeks ago when the appeals panel overturned the judge's decision. So as of today, we are back where we started. The point of this entire story really is that sure, there are legal challenges that we can make, but we're not going to win a battle that we have in front of us in the courts. The fact of the matter is that the government has a ton of power and they have the mandate to use it. But we can win in the fight on the streets. We can make it uncomfortable for them to make decisions that are going to hit Albertans in the pocketbooks and reduce the amount of services that they have access to. And that's why we've begun to talk to you over the last summer and the, in the months prior with our information pickets and what we'll be talking about as this thing progresses. So stay tuned. Thanks for being here tonight, and thanks for listening to this update. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Mike, for the uh, those initial comments, and uh, that's just the beginning of the conversation. So now it's it's your turn, and let's get into a conversation here about uh, some of the points, some of the things that are particularly on your mind. We've got uh, a number of you already in queue, and uh, a reminder just to hit star three if you want to join joining the conversation if you have a question or a comment. So let's go uh, first of all to Mallory, uh, who is uh, from the 108th Street Building worksite. Uh, and <coughs> she has a question. Uh, go ahead, Mallory. Good evening, Mallory. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. So um, my question is, is HSA has already created or plans to create kind of a standard form letter that we could be sending to our MLAs 
specifically regarding uh, the blue panel report um, and our concerns with it, just because not everyone uh, has the time or eloquence to communicate our concerns uh, succinctly. Molly, thank you so much for that question. And that's exactly why we're starting this conversation tonight. Because uh, it's not about just one individual in this fight back. It's about all of us collectively. There are 27,000 members represented in HSAA. And these are, these are one of the pieces that we can look towards to start building this fight back. That letter can absolutely be created. Can we build the capacity within our union to start using it? I think that's possible. Thank you very much for that question. Great, Th thanks Mallory. Uh, next, uh, and, and the other thing is, we're going to take one question at a time, I forgot to mention that. If, if you have another question, you can uh, hit star three again and, and get back in line. We just want to get to as many people as, as possible. Uh, our next uh, caller is Celeste uh, from Northgate Mental Health. Good evening, uh, Celeste. Go ahead, Celeste. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for hosting this. Um, I'm just wondering if it comes down to a strike, how do they determine who it are the essential services. Thanks for that question, uh, Celeste. Uh, first off, I just want to be clear on, on one important piece here. If it comes down to a strike, it is the membership of HSA that decide that, not an individual or not a board, okay? So it's, I want to put that out there as the start of this conversation. But I'm going to turn to Mike Boyle for a quick second to comment on how they determine the essentialness as, a, as he's been working within that parameter for a while here. Hi, uh, good evening. Yeah, um, the, uh, the essential service uh, legislation is, is just new to Alberta. Uh, a lot of the schedules and actually, quite frankly, we haven't even bargained the framework yet. So what happens uh, is you need a framework legally. You also need what they call schedules that determine the essential services at the workplace. Uh, we haven't started that uh, with uh, HSAA. Uh, some of the other unions have started it, but none of them have uh, completed their schedules. The only public service uh, that, I, that, that are part of the group that we're talking about are the direct government employees who have their framework now. But as far as HSA is concerned, uh, we don't have the framework, we don't have the schedules, we're still meeting to talk about that. The process is uh, during bargaining, uh, and there's certain time limits and it's prescribed through legislation now, uh, but all of it is mute and there has to be an essential service agreement bargained um, and in place before a legal strike can occur. So the long and short of it is that you're going to bargain uh, how many positions are essential in each work sector. Yeah, so each, and when I say you have a schedule in the place, what it is is they'll determine in the workplace the specific hospital or site or that, and then they'll determine which are deemed essential under the law, and then those folks uh, are required by law to go in and perform those duties, while the other folks have the constitutional right to strike. So it's, it's, that's how the process, but in Alberta, and under our bargaining certificate for Alberta Health Services, uh, it's the entire uh, certificate that would vote. But then again, that's uh, precluded by getting an agreement first. Great, thanks you guys. Celeste, I'm gonna give you one more piece that, that I've said a few times in the past here. What they, what they, when we use the word essential, it becomes very difficult for a healthcare provider to, to, to feel the essentialness and the criticalness of the work that we all do. Let's be crystal clear, we are all critical in the work that we do. As Mr. Boyle has just kind of said, they will work into the world of essential and non-essential. I would give you this as a consideration. When you look at a holiday shift schedule like Christmas morning, are you coming to work that day or are you not going to work that day? That's, that's some of the consideration, but again, we've got 240 different disciplines and 27,000 employees represented here. It is a very complex document that needs to be built as we move forward. And I hope that, that kind of helps you understand what we're looking at today. I would also go back to Mike's initial response. Uh, a strike is, is brought on and through the members. It's an indicator from the members and the members are indicating uh, their will to take action or do that. So, so that will all be driven by the membership and that's the key point of that in my opinion. Great, thanks Jerry. Next Great, caller. next caller is Pete. Uh, go ahead with your question. You're from Calgary Metro EMS. Good evening Pete. Yeah. Yeah, uh, good evening, and, and uh, thank you uh, for uh, hosting this event and giving us an opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, uh, Mike and uh, gang, I think what I wanted to uh, ask, um, I guess I'm just a bit concerned uh, both with the rhetoric in the 
McKinnon report, and it did a really good job of, you know, starting to villainize uh, public servants uh, and the work we do, and, and kind of, uh, you know, do this <laughs> between uh, public service, uh, you know, and, and those who work uh, outside of public service. But I'm also, I guess, Mike, just a bit concerned about some of the language coming from the union and from the FFA. And I'm just wondering if there's been any consideration at all, sir, to, you know, maybe recognizing that, you know, what we're doing is entrenching ourselves, you know, uh, one side against the other. And that's, you know, that's not going to be helpful for anybody because it's just going to end up being a fight. Is there any way we can approach this differently? Do you think, Mike, have you guys considered maybe trying a different approach? Uh, you know, instead of just uh, doing what we've kind of done since the early 1900s <laughs> um, and, uh, and just pick fights with each other. I, thanks, Pete, for the call. I hear you loud and clear. And, and where we find that, that balance is, is always a challenge. First and foremost, let's be clear, this conversation is membership driven. This is not a, a mic piece or a president piece or even a board of directors piece. This is the members of HSAA that will drive this conversation forward. Uh, the, the, the historical actions of a union, yeah, you bet, uh, a strike and all these other pieces. So those pieces are out there and it's not just HSAA that's involved in those conversations. Uh, AUPE is involved, again, all public sector unions, all unions under the House of Labour are involved in those parts of the conversation or the fight back. What else is out there? Well, we've reached out multiple times to this government to talk. Uh, just today again, we've had another meeting cancelled from the health minister. So we, we struggle with that relationship, but we still continue to try. We do have a conversation Thursday with the labor minister, so that we continue to try. Uh, what, what's happened though, is that as we talk, uh, our information has become less and less from this government. And what we need at the end of the day is our membership to feed that information to us because truly at the end of it, we rely on the members to communicate to run this union because it is their union to, to lead on. I'm going to turn to Trudy or, or Mike if you have any, any other follow-up comments. Yeah, I think uh, your protocol is a, a case in point on us listening to the members and hearing this. This is not uh, something new to us. It's that balance between members feeling a stress and asking the union do something and the stress between trying to make sure we're representing them in a professional and, and, uh, and respectful manner. So uh, we hear you. It's taken in. It's exactly why we have this call, uh, these calls. Uh, really, it's quality uh, healthcare for Albertans uh, by HSA and the members. That's really our, our platform, and we go for there. Uh, and and again, we uh, we are looking at everything, and we're listening to the members. So uh, your point's well taken. Yeah, I, th I think um, one of the, one of the comments that we hear, or one of the concerns for us, is that we get lots of comments from our members, and they are not all with the same opinion. And so it's a balancing act. Um, what are you willing to do? What are you? What action are you willing to take? And so our job, I would believe, is to balance that and try to speak with the biggest voice. And so right now we're talking to you and hopefully we get some answers as where would you like us to go with this? Because this is new, sort of. You know, some of us have been through it before, but this is different again and it seems very, it's scary and people are worried. And so they want a quick reaction. We maybe don't have that quick answer yet. We had, we had a, the first caller tonight say, how about a letter writing campaign? <clears throat> it's written down, what a great idea. That's absolutely how we launch some of these things. What about a gather at an MLA's constituent office? That's a good idea. Uh, and, and everything, everything is on the table right now as we move into the grounds. I mean, we haven't had to deal with this stuff since the 90s. And, uh, and here we are, again. Yeah, Mike, one of the things you said earlier was, one of the options we're going to pursue is some of the legal stuff, but we're not going to win this no. in the courts because that those decisions take ten years sometimes. Uh, to, to and that's not going to help anyone who's who's uh, looking at a layoff uh, in the next year. So we have we have to use a lot of different tactics uh, and and see what what works best. Okay, Lori uh, is from Calgary at the South Health uh, Campus. Go ahead, Lori. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for taking my call. Hi, Lori. Um, Hi, how are you guys? Uh, doing all right, thanks. Good. And I, I just have to say that HSA historically has less leverage than like UNA and other unions. 
um, and we're not always at the top of the healthcare system. So how are we going to fight for us and our wages and our, what we do for our clients? How are you guys going to fight for that for us? Great. Thanks for that call, Lori. Uh, a couple of pieces that I want to highlight here. Uh, one, uh, we have been actively and aggressively promoting HSAA to get ourselves as the as the top dog in the in this whole conversation. And I think over the last few years, we've done a really good job of promoting uh, the front lines of healthcare, our HSAA members, and that work will will continue for sure. Um, fighting fighting for you. This is this is where we need to really highlight this part of a conversation. This becomes our fight together, and it is no longer about. Uh, sending one of our people in to work on some legislation or sending one of our experts in to work on some occupational health and safety language as we've done for the last four years. What this is becoming is an entire fight and it's a pushback fight that is driven by the membership, driven by you guys and moving us all together in that same direction. Because at the end of the day, I can yell and scream all I want on the step to the legislature and that's not going to solve where we're at. It's going to depend on all members standing together because truly we rely on you guys to move this conversation forward and I hope that kind of gives you where we're at. There are, again, there are battles in courts, there are battles on the streets and there is going to be conversations happening for months ahead as we move forward in this. The legislation coming up this fall we predict will be hugely anti-labor and I have grave concerns but uh, that's all just foreshadow yet. I have nothing from from this government. So I guess the question we should ask is, what are we gonna do together in all of this fight? I, I also, sorry, this yeah. Mike Boyle. I think another indicator from past and you know, late 90s, uh, even during the 2012 and 2014, during the pension, when they're talking about a fiscal restraint there, legislation and pension, um, what they do is they test the membership and see if the public, they're testing policy right now, and they're testing it through the McKinnon report to see you know, what, what, what are people going to stand for? What are they going to let happen? And, and I think the message has to come from the workplace that this is not acceptable. Like uh, privatization of, of health care is not acceptable. Uh, not having quality health care workers in the front lines is not acceptable. If they start to hear that in the work sites and they hear 27,000 people saying it and then another 28,000 with nurses and then another couple of hundred thousand with AUP and their uh, LPNs and their general support and their direct government, and then the teachers, that's a lot of voices saying to government, this policy is not acceptable. Uh, right now you've got a board, there's 18 people that are, are they're working and listening to, to our group alone, but really it's gotta be a message that goes through the organization that says, uh, we're just not gonna put up with this. And that's really the strength. Great. Thanks, Lori. Thanks. Uh, we've got Jennifer on the line who works at the Foothills Hospital. Go ahead, Jennifer. Good evening, Jennifer. Hi there, thanks for taking my call. Um, I just wanted to put things a bit in context. Uh, for those folks that have worked only in Alberta, um, you may not be aware that actually salaries, I'm a physical therapist, salaries uh, for me in BC would actually be 30% less with HSBC, and same with Ontario. And I think it's really important to just take a deep breath, take a step back, and remember we're not just HSA members, but we're also taxpayers. And when we look at $22 billion for 4 million people living in Alberta, we have to really wonder where is that money going? And I think obvious is salary. Great, Jennifer. Thanks very much for that. And, and you're right on the numbers. Uh, Alberta leads the way in wages, and for that I will never, never apologize. Uh, our folks deserve every penny they get. And uh, yeah, that's, that's being used a little bit against us here. Uh, and fair enough on your statements. There, there are a lot of research pieces across the world that do talk about uh, alternate delivery models. At the end of the day, HSAA's values lean on public sector work, public sector uh, delivery of health care. And when we have a system where we've been cutting since the 1990s, what I got to tell you is that, that the struggle of our system is that there's nothing left, there's no fat to cut. We're now cutting into the bone and I had a caller or a, an email recently that said, we're now taking the marrow out of the bone, there's nothing left. So, so this is where we struggle as healthcare providers is that we have not been funded enough to be sustainable. Yes, it's expensive, I appreciate that. 30% uh, more, uh, it's a little less than that actually, but, but uh, fair enough, I appreciate your comments. I, I, I can add to a little bit to your question about research. Uh, and in fact, yes, there's been a, a t 
ton of research done on comparisons of public and uh, private models and and it consistently shows that uh, if and if you're looking at the universal universal universality of it all yes. when you look at all the patients the public always comes out as a cheaper delivery model than uh, a private system uh, and, and the simple reason for that is that you don't need when you have a public system you don't have to include profits in the bottom line a, a private system always has to give a shareholder profit. So you can look at things on the Parkland Institute's website, you can look at studies uh, at, on CCPA, which is Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. Thank you. <laughs> I always uh, uh, bumble that up. Uh, there's lots of studies that come out of Britain that has a pretty decent uh, public uh, health care model and, and also out of uh, Scandinavia uh, that has strong public health care and there not only are their uh, costs lower but their outcomes are better. So, so there is yeah, tons, tons and tons of, of evidence that. towards that. Uh, next, let's go to Medicine Hat and uh, talk to Christopher. Good go evening, ahead, Christopher. Christopher. Hey guys, thanks so much for taking my call. And, uh, oh, thanks for calling in. Uh, really appreciate the answer to the last question. Um, about half of my question has been answered already, and it was around the idea of um, striking. And I guess the biggest thing I'm just left wondering about, you might not be able to answer, because I know that it would be a decision collectively reached by all of us as members. You know, when is it that we look at strike as a serious possibility? Is it if it's another 0% increase, if it's a 5% rollback, a 10% rollback? I'm wondering any input at all on that. Christopher, I, I think you uh, you were probably in the conversation that started uh, to uh, for us to have these town halls uh, because that's exactly where we're at. Uh, I don't have that answer today, and I am sitting here, and I know that our board of directors are sitting on phones right now, listening to this conversation, going, "Where is it, and what happened?" So timeline-wise, we've got to get through an open period in bargaining. We've got to have that discussion with the employer. And, and at some point, you're going to see my opinion right now, and I'm going to have to wait a little bit longer, is you're going to see legislation come down that defines what that bargaining is going to look like. And at that point, it's going to be a discussion between all of us as members on the front lines of healthcare to try and figure out where we go next. And you're right, I, I don't know the answer. Is it what, if we go back in time, there was a government that took a shot at our pensions, and our members lit up and rallied and this entire province was shaking at the end of the day and they knew damn well that public sector was going to defend their rights to have a pension. Is that the conversation we're having today? No. Are we moving towards that kind of conversation? I believe we are. I believe that at the end of the day there's going to be an action from this government and, and as Mike has just say, said a few minutes ago, they're testing right now. They're testing our abilities to respond. They're testing our abilities to see how far they can push us. And that question again will come to you, the membership. What is it? And you, you nailed it. Is it zero? Is it minus five? Is it the deletion of a pension? I don't know the answer today, but I know we're going to have a conversation about that very soon. All right. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, we've got tons of people on the line. This is very <coughs> exciting. Uh, it's obviously something you guys want to talk about. Uh, let's go to Candice uh, in Crows and S Pass. Good evening, Candice. Hello, thank you for taking my call. Welcome. Um, so I had a little fright last evening watching Alberta Prime Time. Okay. And it was very anti-union. Um, and I'm just wondering if we will have a chance to have our voices heard in the same kind of platform. Thank you very much for that. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I was on the road last night. Um, you might be the one of the other three people that watch prime time, including myself, but, but great. Uh, I, I don't know what the article was on and I accept every invitation from Alberta prime time. It's either myself or the vice president uh, gets ourselves in there to have a conversation and happy to defend the work of, of our union every single day and the members that, that represent that we represent through HSA. So, and we might uh, get our communications folks to uh, give them a little nudge and uh, and say we we deserve some uh, spare time. So I need a haircut. Maybe, do I, yeah, is it yeah. time to go back on camera? Yeah. yeah okay. Mark, get him uh, to the barber. Uh, that's his assistant. Uh, Denise. Denise is uh, in Sturgeon Community Hospital. Go ahead. Hi, Denise. Oh, hi, 
Hi, Mike. Hi, everybody. Hey. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, can you hear me? You yeah. betcha. Okay, so I did have a question that I first really kind of wanted to address. I think it was uh, the speaker from Foothills um, uh, when she was just talking about the wages and the $22 billion deficit budget that we have in, in Alberta. Uh, and kind of along the same lines that you sort of mentioned, um, Mike, and I couldn't agree with you any further, in that we know that we make a really good a livable wage here in Alberta, but we can't look to wages as the reason why, you know, the progressive conservative, in my opinion, and now the UPC, has kind of left the province after 41 plus years under their reign, uh, with the kind of budget that, that they have. We can't blame the NDP party, in my opinion, in, in one four-year term for this massive deficit, and it certainly isn't because of our wages. Um, Thank you, Denise. Everybody that's listening in. Yeah, you're welcome. Everybody knows in this conference call that we work really hard for our money. I'm not saying the Foothills person doesn't believe we do. I believe that she does believe that, but in that we have to look at where is the other waste that's going on. I mean, you open this up by saying there was a $4.5 billion revenue uh, break that were given to companies within Alberta. So, I mean, if, if we look at that compared to, you know, um, increases in wages so that we can have a good livable wage in Alberta, I think we have to look to where the government is basically, you know, wasting our money. And certainly, like, all these appeals and all of these studies is not a good way, even today watching about the federal government and spending, what, $4.5 million just on spousal travel. So, you know, if the feds are doing it, then probably Jason Kinney and the UPC party or the progressive conservatives before certainly were. My question, though, was really more tailored to, you know, I'm not a political analyst, but I think it would be safe to say that when we saw Jason Kinney uh, was leader of the, you know, United Progressive Conservative Party and then obviously won, uh, that there was going to be big changes. I mean, we all know that the Progressive Conservative Party, or most of us would agree, that they're kind of union-busting uh, type of government. And Jason Kenney made it no secret in his platform when he was running uh, that there was a lot of bureaucratic bloat and that his idea was that he was going to be cutting health care budgets by reducing wait times for minor procedures and improving wait times through private delivery. So knowing all of that, knowing where we came from the 90s and that we're here and our collective agreement was zero, zero and a wage reopener and we're still in this situation, you know, I always say that we, we the members are the union and I do strongly believe that still today. But when I work at work like we all do and we're busy and I pay the union dues, obviously I know you guys are watching for our best interest, but I want to know since he was elected, what because we don't want to be a reactive union what steps were taken in place so that we can be prepared for the kind of legislation like you say is coming down the pipeline what what's been going on and you know that we are not uh, currently aware of that, that we can take to our members and say this is what we're doing together to fight this guy and his party denise thank you so much for your for your first off your statement secondly your question you, you nailed it what what have we been what have we been up to in the last little while? Well, he's been in for now just a few months, right? So here's what we're looking like. Uh, we took on that challenge that came under Bill Nine, and we were absolutely part of that conversation. Within the House of Labor, all public sector workers are consolidating their information and building their allegiances with each other to defend attacks on public sector work. Uh, we will, and that work will absolutely continue. Uh, there is other work through the Federation of Labor that is ongoing right now, and, and that's going to also continue. Uh, some of this stuff, though, here, here's, here's some of the concerns that, that I have as, as the president in this role right now, is that we used to have a pipeline of information. We'd have a conversation with the government before they launched a piece of legislation, or before they were going to do something, we would have these discussions with them. Today, I have nothing. So I rely now exclusively on members on the front lines to message our office and say, hey, Mike, did you know that they didn't hire this position? Or hey, Mike, did you know that they've cut this, this site that was delivering a service to people? That's the only information we have right now. 
And, and that's, it, and unfortunately, it does put us in a bit of a reactionary uh, position. Are we launching campaigns this fall? You bet. Are we gonna stand and defend our members' jobs? You bet we are. That's gonna happen every day. Our staff are out there uh, talking this exact same conversation to every member that they come in contact with as well. I'm gonna to turn to Mike Boyle. He's got a few more comments to you, yeah. uh, I hope as well. Yeah, and, and to Mike's point earlier, we are uh, totally reacting. Before with the labor-friendly government, we were consulted. Part of their consultation was to meet public sector unions and, and uh, people at large, uh, a little different than the uh, business-oriented government that uh, is uh, very clear that they're not uh, going to consult us or, or look at, they're trying to uh, marginalize us as special interest groups, which is a problem for us. So right now, as Mike says, we're relying on the members for information, but, but what we also are doing is everything we have within our, uh, within our arsenal here, uh, legally we've got our lawyers aligned with uh, AP's lawyers and UNA's lawyers and other lawyers to make sure we're doing the same strategies. We have a statement of claim in that went in with Bill 9 to say, you know, these are the damages and we've got intervener status at the Labor Board. We're also lining up to see what's happening at their interest arbitration that they had, but then was uh, kind of pulled back by the court decision on Thursday. So we're working uh, with our, our partners as much as we can. We have our legal teams, we have our labor teams. We have uh, OH&S also working together because we're fearful that all the gains we made four years ago are now uh, going to be rescinded. Uh, and again, we're looking at responding, but we have to talk. There's certain indicators such as taking the word public out of there. Those policy decisions are indicators. Uh, I was around uh, way back in the 90s with the minus five, but they were talking about privatization of jails. And the only thing that really worked was when our members got into the rural areas and started to say, how will this affect our families? How will it affect the economy of, the, uh, of these towns and, and cities? And those, that was the biggest force that actually stopped that. And what we did is we had the information before they could set policy and legislation. Mm -hmm. So those are the types of things we're doing. Again, though, there's so many things and it's so insular and you'll see when they do release legislation and public uh, uh, releases there, it's extremely insular. And even the people in government, the bureaucrats and the deputies, are unaware of what's coming and it's, it's released the day before and then we have to respond. So we're just laying the current landscape for you folks and we're really, really urging you to help us uh, get the, to be a little bit better than we are. So there's lots of uh, co coalition and coordination that's happening behind the scenes and unfortunately for you as membership, that's that's tough because you're, you're not seeing it yet, but uh, uh, you, you can be assured that as soon as uh, something, as soon as they get going with the really bad stuff that we're anticipating, uh, we'll be ready to launch. I know the Alberta Federation of Labor uh, has passed and we're working very closely with them. Yeah, and Jerry, I forget to just add one last yeah. piece. I know we got a lot of callers I want to get to them all. Uh, but what we have to look at here is that, yes, we will have to react to this stuff, but yes, it's driven from the membership. And that's why this call, and, and probably more calls in the future if I get my way with, the, with this conversation, is that this is how you, you give me the lens and the ability to know where I need to go in the next level of conversation. That's how I get those tools to fight on your behalf. Okay, we have about 15 minutes left and okay. uh, a ton of people in the queue. Let's go. So we're, we're going to go into rapid fire round <laughs> here. So if, uh, uh, we're going to keep the speeches short and the questions quick and the answers. So Mike Boyle isn't allowed to answer any <laughs> questions. So next, we're going to go to Fritz Bitz uh, from Wetaskiwin. Hey Fritz, how are you? Great, Mike. Hi. Can you hear me well enough? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Okay. So my concern is this, we don't have essential services named yet, yeah. um, we're all expecting that the uh, UCP government is going to come at us with a uh, insistence on a wage rollback and uh, my, my question is this, we not only have the right to strike, they have the right to lock out. Yep. So, what is the process for lockout? Okay. Can it happen before they are prepared to negotiate the essential services list? And um, okay. and I guess how um, how deep is the possibility? Are they possibly going to go as deep as twenty percent? Okay, Fritz, I, I appreciate that, and, and you've touched on some pieces that 
that we sit and discuss on a, on a regular basis. So, th so the first piece I want to talk about here is the strike slash lockout conversation. When you look at labor law, it must follow a process. And that is what, when people say, what's the value of the union? Well, here's the value right here of a union. All of this conversation on strike and lockout, it all must follow a process. We must have an open period in our collective bargaining agreement. We must have uh, fruitful discussions between us and the employer. We must give timeline notices and file for, for these conversations, have cooling off periods, all these labor law pieces that must be followed. And then we must have an essential services agreement concluded before we can have a strike. Or a lockout. Or a lockout. Today, that's what the law is. That's what the law is today. Now I'm going to give you one more piece that's a burr in my, 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 my butt right now is that our new government is telling us that they were elected on a mandate to remove the replacement workers language in our ESA discussions. Now I'm going to give you a second here. We agree to send people in. They agree to let us have a, a essential services strike. And what I'm hearing now under the mandate of the current government is that they can bring in replacement workers on top of our essential workers. Now, how does that work in an in a, in essential services strike? Well, in my mind, it does not. So if you, you know, so these are the conversations that are going on right now. We have some very interesting times ahead. And Fritz, you threw out one last piece there to say uh, the 20%. Uh, I am not gonna sit here and throw darts at a board with you folks tonight. I am giving you everything that I know as of today. I have no numbers. I have only only uh, uh, wind uh, as, uh, sounds in the wind right now. I have nothing official to tell you, and when I do, you folks will be the first to know. Well, and uh, I just I just like to add um, because people are talking and because we're in a wage reopener, that is still in the existing agreement. We are not into open bargaining period for most of our agreements until 2020. So. This is not something that's going to happen now. We have to actually go through the stages of bargaining before we would ever get to strike or a lockout. So time, it, you know, yeah. it's not an urgent thing. It's not going to happen anytime quickly. All right, let's go quickly to Mike, uh, who is with uh, Peace River EMS Dispatch. Hey, Mike, how are hey, you? Mike. Good, how are you guys? Uh, doing okay, sir. So you guys are touching on exactly what my question is for, and that's the upcoming end of this contract being the third year and I want to know how Bill 9 affects us starting on negotiations which essentially have to be notified I believe end of January beginning of February there's certain timelines and the way things are going okay Th uh, thanks Mike so here's what I'm gonna say on all this uh, if you imagine a bunch of cars heading down the highway there's a couple of cars that are ahead of us right now in all of this uh, AUPE has gone to court, they got their injunction, they got turned over by the government, they tried to get dates scheduled. They are doing all of this a few months ahead of where we were scheduled to do ours. So all of that stuff is happening on another union. That's how I kind of, in my opening statements, I said, there are many players on the labor side that are all kind of moving forward on this conversation. And we are scheduled for the end of September for ours to happen. And, and, no, sorry, no. what is the opening? Yeah, so, so just... Here's Mike Boyle here. Yeah, so you're exactly right. So what's happening is in the law now, Bill 9 has <coughs> been in effect. Ours will be deferred to the spring. Okay, thanks. The UPs and UNAS is coming to the end of the fall. But uh, we are also serving notice in December to start a new round of bargaining, which starts the three. So everything is kind of at a log jam right now. So we are looking at uh, basically starting bargaining and having our interest starve at the same time. Yeah, it's so confusing. Yes. Uh, so essentially, Bill 9 has nothing to do with our current contract. No, he's right. Like we serve, next? we it, serve notice for yeah. April 1st. And we'll serve notice uh, by and the then any the legislation that comes this fall that's what you need to watch that's going to maybe uh, if they if they do what we expect them to that'll impact the yeah. next round one one thing mike is to be mindful and anybody who's listening that's why the focus for this year's labor relations conference in october will be very much on how do we proceed with the next round of bargaining and uh, 
Mike Boyle and his team will be planning on how we do that. In the past, we've sent you out a survey in the fall. Yeah. This year, we're not going to send out a survey until after we have the bargaining conference to see in what direction we should be taking it. So it's going to be a different way of looking at it and to prepare for labor relations in 2020 in Alberta. Yeah. We're, going right. to write, we're going to write history. <laughs> All right, we are now going to Jennifer, who is with APL. Go ahead, Jennifer, with your question. Hi, Jennifer. Uh, uh, hi, how are you guys doing? Thanks. Doing okay, thanks. Um, I am just curious, I had a very similar question to the like, for, uh, former caller. Uh, with us being with APL, we're uh, currently going into a transitional bargaining agreement. Yeah. So I guess with that uh, information, would we just remain with that transitional bargaining agreement until everything gets figured out or are we going to go into bargaining in April again? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn it to Mike in a second, but let's see how well I can do with this one. Your guys' transitional bargaining will continue as scheduled. Historically, what you've seen is that, is that other large uh, collective agreements within our union will sit and wait until the main body agreement of AHS is, is concluded, and then those ones will wrap up as a subsequent conversation. But I'm just going to turn to Mike because he might know some more than I do on, on some of this stuff. Yeah, so right now the, we're in life because the board decision just came down and we're in transitional bargaining uh, for the paramedical technical. We have a receiving agreement set to be determined for the office of clerical, but you're right in line bargaining or what they call an open period right now to get uh, those terms and conditions into that contract. What will come from that is the uh, cadence or the sequencing of the open and when it'll close uh, from that. So you're really not tied to the big bargaining right now, but that will be considered in your bargaining and then it will be determined at bargaining as to when it is closed and when you will open. But you'll follow the same conditions of the Labour Code. Thanks Mike. Uh, I'm just looking at the screens that Jerry is monitoring here and obviously uh, we've, we've hit this one on the head and for any of our board of directors that's listening, uh, we have substantial interest tonight on this conversation and there are uh, more than 20 calls in queue. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to all of those calls, I don't think, tonight, but I think this sets the tone that we'll be having these conversations more often. And I believe at the end of it all, Jerry's got an email yeah. address for you, but let's get through a couple more calls. So, a couple of things you can prepare for right now. Uh, you can always uh, contact info at hsaa.ca with your questions, uh, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Uh, you can also call the MRC, which number, I always forget, one eight four four. Who's got it? 280-4722. Great. So that's a very important number to remember that I can't. Uh, and, uh, and we'll take two more calls uh, only, I think, and then we're, we are out of time, I'm afraid. Okay, let's go quickly to Shelly uh, from Lethbridge Regional Hospital. Go ahead, Shelly. Shelly. Oh, thanks for taking my call. You bet. Um, I'm just wondering if Health Sciences is aware of the Ernst & Young survey that was dropped in our email box yesterday. Um, it was touted as a satisfaction survey, but as I got to page two, I felt very strongly that I was being herded towards agreeing to exactly what, what the government is looking for here. Um, one of the questions being, do I agree or disagree that frontline staff need to be uh, fiscally responsible? Um, and I'm just wondering if the employer or government will be trying to use this survey against us. Uh, well, you want my opinion here? I'm going to give it to you. It, yes, 100%. Yes, this is what they're doing. They call this BS consultation and this is this is how they're going to say well we talked to the union we talked to the members on the front lines of health care should we be fiscally responsible give me a break what kind of question is that how about uh, the wait lists that are that are three days long how about our mental health folks that can't get a day off let's talk about these real conversations instead of this mockery that they have sent out for a survey so yes they will be using it against us as a tool and it'll be in the court of public opinion when they bring it out and our final question goes to Mina from Royal Alec, uh, who I think is a person after my own heart. So go ahead with your question. Mina? Hi there. Um, I'm just calling to uh, say that like, I'm a younger member, um, uh, but I uh, maybe don't remember the last time you guys went through this. But um, I'm less concerned about percentages being knocked off my wage, and I'm more more incensed about the systematic dismantling of my healthcare system and the future healthcare system that my family will rely on. 
Um, and I'm just wondering, like, like that first member that was saying, you know, like, what about introducing privatization and things like that? Like, I think we need education not only for our own members, but for the public and really smart, like, quick, attractive marketing and campaigns to really make the public think about, like, you know, um, like what what could happen to your healthcare system? This this system that weaves in and out of your entire lifetime. Um, and I'm just wondering if you're going to be, you know, working in coalitions with people like the Canadian Health Coalition or Friends of Medicare, or you know, like really developing and leading on the research that is out there that that really demonstrates that like this is not just about wages and pennies or dollars on my paycheck. This is about a value system. And this is about what do you want your future to look like, your future country to look like. Mina, thanks so much. And I'll, I'll be clear on this. Uh, you're worried and, and sister, so am I. Uh, we, we went through this in the 90s and talked to any of your colleagues that were around during those days. It was an absolute decimation of our healthcare system where people migrated to other provinces, other countries to try and find some kind of stability in their lives. Uh, is that coming again? I'm going to tell you right now as, as the president of this union, yes. Uh, they are looking to target health care. They are looking to uh, remove any public from the titles and advance privatization and to be crystal clear, once you privatize a system within health care, there is no getting it back. So when you see, like I said, uh, there, are, there are companies out there sniffing around to privatize our EMS workers. There are companies out there capable of privatizing the entire lab service in this province. I just, those two comments I've just made represent almost 6,000 of our members in HSAA. So this is the reality that we face today, folks. This is the crisis that we're gonna walk into, and the only way we're gonna get through it is together united as a labor front within health sciences and all public sector workers in this province. And damn right, we're pulling in all allies, including uh, Friends of Medicare, Parkland, national bodies, you name it. We're calling on everyone to join this fight because this has become the front lines of the labor movement in this country is right here in Alberta now. So uh, thank you for that. Does anybody else want to chime in? My friends, I am sorry. This uh, conversation went on uh, unbelievably. I can't believe we have still have people on the line with questions and I deeply apologize that we are not able to get to you tonight. But there are a lot of ways that you can get a hold of us and we'll get back to you. One of them is just stay on the line at the end of the call and you can leave a message uh, and we'll get that uh, and we'll get your information and we'll try to work through those in the coming days. I can't promise you it'll all be tomorrow. Uh, I know that Mike and uh, Trudy and the board have, have meetings for the rest of the week, but uh, we will get, uh, we'll get on them for sure. Uh, you can uh, email us at info at hsaa.ca. That's a great way. You can uh, join with us online at, uh, on our Twitter feed or on our Facebook po uh, page, or you can call our MRC at one 4722 All of this is on the uh, website, which is hsaa.ca. That is a lot of information in a short Ooh, period of time. I'm out of breath. Thank you very much for all of you who are still with us. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you, Mike and Trudy and Mike, for your uh, input tonight. And uh, uh, we'll just uh, keep working on this uh, one step at a time and we'll do what we can to keep you informed. Okay, thanks very much and uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. Good night.